Hello, I am back. I have returned and I'm going to make a video about some ideas I've been thinking about in relation to typology. I have been thinking about this ever since um, uh, I think my one of my I think my most my third interview with Jack Aaron, my third sort of discussion podcast with Jack Aaron of World Socionic Society. Um, so that is kind of where this all started, but uh, um, yeah, let's just, let's just, we'll start this way. Let me grab a piece of chalk. Uh, that hopefully won't, but, oh, one over here. Bum. All right. So we're looking over there. Yes. Let me, no, like so. If I bring it back like this, just don't want my head being kind of constantly cut off by the top. Eh, that'll work. All right. Um, we'll start over here. So we're going to start with uh, moats and beams, with sort of the system that I laid out in moats and beams. Actually, this side will work better. So you have, uh, and this goes back to Young, because you have the traditional cross. Should all be able to see that all right. And um, you, so you have the perception axis and you have the judgment axis. That's pretty small, but um, you get the idea. So perception and judgment. And then you have two kinds of perception. As we all know, you have sensation and you have intuition. And over here you have, how did I do it? Yes, I put feeling over here and thinking over here. We've all seen this. They're split this way. The addition that I made in Motes and Beams, the innovation you could say, was because um, what I wanted to do was I wanted to further differentiate these. I wanted to create a way that you could build the, the functions up from the ground, from basic definitions. And perception and judgment is not enough to do that. Um, you need something in addition in order to distinguish sensation from intuition. Why do they split off? What is the dichotomy that accounts for that split? And so, you know, if you do it like this, you can draw a simple table here where you have perception, judgment, and then you have sensation, you have intuition, and you have thinking, and you have feeling, right? So what is, that's kind of a sloppy table, sorry, but you get the idea? What's over here and what's over here? And what I came up with in Motes and Beams was you have denotation and you have connotation. Sensation and thinking are denotated. Uh, intuition and feeling are connotated. At the moment, it doesn't even really matter what denotation and connotation mean. All that matters for our purposes, purely structural, is that it is what differentiates these two from each other. And we can represent that up here. I did not do this in the book, but I will here. Um, sensation and thinking are connected here by denotation, and intuition and feeling are connected here by connotation. Cool, now we have a nice sideways hourglass, or whatever you want to call it. So everything's hunky-dory, and then Jack Aaron shows up, <laughs> and what he says is, hold on, because he's the one who actually kind of draws, I, I don't think he ever drew it out like this, but in his mind, as it were, he drew it out. Um, and he didn't actually start here. He started with the, um, well, well, we'll get to that later in the video, but he started with the temperaments and then it, it kind of has worked its way backward here because the structure is a bit fractal and it, it, um, it anyway. So what he ends up doing, and I suppose I don't even need to draw that line there yet, but, um, he says, well, what about the connection between sensation and feeling? Because in this, in this scenario, feeling and sensation are the most different from each other, right? Whereas thinking and intuition are kind of like the hybrids, right? They're the mediators, but these two are completely different from each other. And in some sense, intuition and, and thinking in this model are also completely different from each other. Um, and yet, Two problems with that. One is that Jung himself seems to have felt that there was indeed a connection between sensation and feeling, and I think intuitively we can sense that to be the case, and the same with intuition and thinking. 
Um, there's no, there, it, it really, there isn't anything about the way we understand these other than, you know, the fact that I've built them out of these opposed properties. But taken in themselves, they seem to be able to, to connect with each other. Um, and also you kind of have this, the asymmetry is what, is what Jack Aaron didn't, didn't really like. He's like, well, what if we add in a connection like so? And by the way, um, in some sense, I could very well have decided to make the connection like that when I wrote Motes and Beams. I could have, in some sense, it was arbitrary that I, I decided to make that split there, right? Um, I don't, I, the justification that I give um, is that it, for me in the book, if I recall correctly, um, it just seemed intuitively obvious that these two were connected. I was appealing to the intuition, but in Jack Aaron kind of, I'm attributing things to Jack Aaron which he did not explicitly say. I've sort of, at this point, Jack Aaron has become like this Socrates that I argue with. So thanks for that, Jack. Um, <laughs> but, um, there's, you know, it's like, why can't sensation and feeling go together? I mean, why not? It, and it seems like, um, uh, I, I know it's weird that I would ask people to check, what did I write in the book? <laughs> did, did I give a better explanation of this in the book? Because I haven't retained it, and I feel embarrassed about that. I, um, it's just a weird thing of how I relate to the material that I write. It's, it's, my ideas continue to develop and I will have ideas when I am writing that I will put down on the page but that came to me in the course of the writing and that make the system fit together but then later on I, I, won't, I won't have retained it because I didn't learn it in the same way I did other things. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but that, that's something I've kind of been realizing with Motes and Beams is how much there are things in the book which I will go back, it's like I can go back and read the book a little bit like I haven't read the book before, which is cool, but also disconcerting because I'm afraid someone's gonna ask me a question and I'll sound, I'm terrified people will think I didn't write the book, which is a weird thing to be afraid of, but um, like, I, I mean, you can pretend I didn't write it or not. Anyway, um, returning to this, so, Jack Aaron's like, well, let's come up with a dichotomy to connect these two together. Now, Jack, Jack has been making a number of videos lately, and I am not caught up on all of them. My apologies, Jack. Um, but he's been doing quite a bit of work, um, and uh, I don't know if he has changed the terms. So the terms that I use here are the original ones that he came up with like a year or two ago. And I don't know where he himself has gone, but I'm going to use these original terms because they've, they're what have stuck in my head. So they were involved and detached, right? Sensation and feeling are involved. There is this involvement with the object and thinking and intuition are, there's a detachment from the object. And one more thing I'll go ahead and point out is that, uh, and is there room? Yeah, there's a little bit of room over here. So what you, and what I do do in Motes and Beams, and some people have picked out, and this is, I feel rather important, is I, I assert that all of these dichotomies ultimately share characteristics and you can put them in, you know, if you put extroversion over here, an introversion over here, they all, to, in a certain way, are manifestations of the same original kind of yin-yang pair, um, where uh, of order and chaos, male and female, you can link it up archetypally with all sorts of things. And the way that they split out is perception is more extroverted because it has more to do with the object. It's whoosh, I keep making this motion. Um, whereas judgment is more internal, um, it's a more interior process. Uh, what were the others? That's right. Um, denotation is more extroverted because it is just what the thing itself denotes, whereas connotation is more introverted because it is what you as the subject 
interpret into the object and see as connections. And then finally, the abbreviations I will use for involved um, will be V, uh, because it's involved, otherwise I'd have to use I or N and that gets confusing. So involved, because um, it's an involvement with the object, and then detached, which I will shoot. I was going to use T, but that doesn't work because <laughs> detached. Um, we'll use a lowercase t. That's what we'll do. A lowercase t. So it's not thinking, it's detachment. That's what we'll do. I suppose I could do H. But uh, you know what? We'll do H. Let's do H. I used, see, I, anyway, it doesn't matter. OK, cool. So that's how they split down. And um, you can see how they kind of have, each one has more to do with this than the other. Now, the thing that happens here is so, so Jack brought in involvement and detachment. And he's like, great. So now we have extra dichotomies. And then he transferred that over to the temperaments, as I'll show in a little bit. Um, but I got thinking about this because I was like, huh. Somehow, intuitively, I feel that this messes with, with the, because the way I set up the system in Motes and Beams, I set it up so that intuitively for me, it was perfectly balanced. Everything was in its proper place. And then Jack introduced this, and I'm like, let me double check this, because something I feel like is, is maybe tilted off balance here. And um, so what I ended up doing, and one of the, so as, as a part of my being here in the master's program, I have refreshed and really sharpened my understanding of propositional logic, which is going to be important for the next part, because uh, it's very helpful for understanding many of the binary systems that I, I was sort of playing around with in an amateurish way, not in the derogatory sense of amateur, but just that it wasn't a professional thing. Um, I guess none of this is professional, but. Um, yeah, so what you can do, so right, you have this, right? And then you can also, I'll step over here. Oh, you can't see me there. We'll do it over here, it's fine. Um, I'll have to erase it. Well, actually, so you have this thing here, right? Um, but if we want to do it for involvement and detachment, heat perception and judgment, um, then what you end up having to do is sensation and intuition stay in the same place. Pardon me. Uh, so we'll put, oh right, I'm going to use V and H. Sensation stays there because it's perceiving and involved, perceiving and detached. Judging and involved would be feeling and judging and detached would be thinking. So those have now switched places in this arrangement and no longer is feeling uh, the opposite of sensation. Um, it is now sensation and thinking are more opposite to each other. And so what you've effectively done is you have gotten rid of, in the original structure, it was more linear in a sense, but this has become much more lateral because it has removed the, uh, well, what it's done is it has made things, I, I used this example in my uh, uh, eight dichotomies video. Um, it has made things into a triangular prism. So you can, I don't know if you can kind of imagine that, that you have, um, in fact, actually we could, we could fill it in like that. And then you kind of have, one side like that, and the other side kind of like that. The point is this is a triangular prism. And then we can put S up here, and N down here, and F over here, and T over there, like that. And each one is connected to every other one uh, by a line. And if this were a true uh, triangular prism, they would all be equal lines. Think of a four-sided die. And so there's a wonderful symmetry here, which I actually really appreciate. Um, and it reflects this very well, where nothing is truly the pure opposite. Everything is, an op is in opposition to everything else equally. And so there's a balance there. The problem is, and this is what I realized, is that there is also, although it is perfectly balanced and has the symmetry to it, it also 
overdetermines um, things. And what I mean by that is this. And what I've ultimately concluded is that, that I'm not going to consider this a problem, but it's just something that I found very interesting. And yeah, it, it's just different. Um, and so what's the best way of, of, uh, of explaining this? So you have, um, right, so you have P here, so it would be this edge, right? It's perception, and then judgment is this edge back here in, in the background, and then involvement is this edge, detachment, oh, we're using, sorry, we're using, there we go, detachment and denotation and connotation, like so. So the thing is, is that for any, unlike in my original system where each coordinate has an X and a Y, as it were, for you to say X here, Y here, boom, sensation. You can coordinate everything with just two variables. But in this one, even though we still only have four points you can go to, there's only four places you can go to, there are three variables to describe where everything is. And that's what I mean by overdetermine. So there's multiple ways to get where you want to on the structure. This is parsimonious. Um, th this is parsimonious, but it, it's it, in exchange for being linear is the word I've been using. It, it has this imbalance to it where this is, uh, uh, this is more purely extroverted, right? Because it's perceiving and involved. And this is more purely introverted. And then these are hybrids. Right? That was what originally prompted this, as I'll show later on. Yeah, we're still good on time. Um, so, ba, 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 ba. so like that. So you, I think hopefully you're starting to see what I mean by overdetermination, is that there's multiple ways to get there. Another way of showing this is, and this is what originally I did and what sort of spurred a lot of my thinking on this, is um, so if what we do is we have like, uh, a table down there, right? But if what we do is, uh, bah, bah, bah. yeah, so we'll do it this way. So let's take one variable. We'll call it P, P for perception. And then we can, uh, about any of, the, uh, any of the four functions, we can ask, is it perceiving? And if it is, we will put a check mark. And if it isn't, we will put an X. And if you know anything about propositional logic, the check mark would be true and the X would be false. This is just a, a formal way of, of showing it. So if we have two variables, so we have perceiving and judging, perception versus judgment. So if it isn't perceiving, that means it's judging, just so, that's, just so that that is clear. Um, we're, we're converting it into a kind of truth table format. Um, so perceiving, check mark. Not perceiving means it's judgment. We can do the same thing over here with, uh, sure, we'll, no, we'll, we'll go back to the basics. We'll make it denotative. If it is denotative, check mark. If it is not denotative, X, meaning it is connotative. So as it turns out, there are four combinations that you can get, and these four combinations correspond. Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead, because I'll be erasing some of this. Um, those four combinations correspond, uh, as it was over there when it wasn't involvement detachment. Uh, sensation, perceiving, but connotative, intuition, uh, not perceiving, but denotative thinking, and then down here, feeling, right? So that would be a two variable truth table. Very parsimonious, very nice. But once you introduce another variable, how many combinations do you get? It's no longer four, even though we only have four functions. You see, in fact, and I, I, I don't know, I should have mentioned this before, but um, I use the same basic system in order to generate the eight functions because the, ex the new variable that I introduce is extroversion, introversion. 
right? So let's do chalk maybe this one. Um, so what you do, so I've got to erase this. And I'll go ahead and erase this just so I have some more room. So what you do, right, is you have perception, and then I had, I'm going to use lowercase letters, denotation, and then you have extroversion, right? And then you generate eight combinations. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, actually, it's easier to do it this way. Right? Because you have four functions, the two function axes, which are perceiving, and then the four functions, which are judging. You get the idea. Um, and then it's alternating every other one. All right? Eight combinations, and that's how I generated the eight functions. I won't write them all in there, but um, the problem is, is that what we've done now is before we got to adding an extroversion introversion, we've added in a new variable already. And that new variable, as we shall represent it here, uh, is we'll say involvement. We'll make that the token, as it were. Um, so if it is involved, then we'll do the check mark. Um, and by the way, you can notice that the ones that I chose to be the tokens are the extroverted ones, um, just as a matter of um, convention. So we can actually go ahead and I'm just going to check over what I had over there so I don't have to figure it all out in my head. So sensation corresponds here. Um, and then intuition is here. Actually, it'll probably be a good idea to do this. Welcome to my chalkboard ASMR video. Uh, yes, and then that's intuition, and then where is yes? Thinking, and then feeling, right there. Uh, right, because sensation is perceiving, it's denotative, and it's involved. But what about a function which is perceiving, denotative, but detached? Well, hold on here. If we go over here, let's see here. Perceiving, denotative, and detached. Well, we have one which is judging, denotative, and detached. And that would be ba -ba -ba -ba, right here. Judging, denotative, detached, thinking. That's accounted for in our original diagram. But over here, we have extra stuff. And you see, we didn't run into that problem over here because it's a triangular prism. We accepted this overdetermination within the geometry of the system so that we were OK with there being, I feel like I'm not explaining this very well, but we're OK with there being multiple, there being more information in the system to describe the points in the system. There, is, there, are, there, is, there are less things you can get out of the system than there are variables to describe those things in the system. It's, it's very odd to me. Um, and when you try to unravel that and say, well, let's make it parsimonious again, well, we're back at eight variables, um, like here. And it's like, what's this? What's this? What is something that is perceiving denotative, just like sensation, but it's detached. Well, normally we would say that that is intuition, except that doesn't make sense because intuition is connotative. It's not denotative. So we don't know what this is. So for now, we'll go ahead and just for laughs and guffaws, we'll call it uh, laughs and guffaws, as my father would say. It is the logical opposite of, let's see, check, check, check. I think that's right. It's, we'll call it not feeling or nega feeling. The feeling, the dark feeling or something. I don't know. Um, it's just because it's, it's the opposite of here. Check mark, check mark, X, 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 check mark. Up here, check mark, X, check mark, X, check mark, X. So this is not thinking, intuition, uh, I believe. Do, do, do. Yes, that's right. Not intuition and then down here is 
not sensation, the opposite of sensation. And if we wanted to, because at this point, and I remember when I was doing this, I was like, huh, okay, maybe I had it wrong. Maybe there are like more functions going on here that arise naturally from the system and I'll have a whole new book I need to write on this. Um, so let's try what happens if we take this and try reconverting it back into the geometry. Well, you, uh, some of you probably see where I'm going with this. So, well, you have, we already have one triangular prism. This is going to be a terrible drawing, and in fact, I don't know if I'll be able to draw it. We have, so that's one triangular prism. I'm not drawing the line underneath it, it's just imagine it's 3D. Um, and this is where we have S, and we have feeling, thinking, intuition. Great, all accounted for. But then, uh, right, and we have these relations as shown up there. But then in order to represent the, the nega functions, as it were, the not functions, um, we have to flip something around. And I had it written over there. That's right. We, we end up, if we flip the involvement and the detachment's places, then we get the nega structure. It sounds so like cool sounding on the next structure. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this. So the nega structure is very simple. It's sorry, it's not like that. Boom, and you have this, 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 this. This is still perceiving. This is still judging. This is still connotative. This is still denotative. But now involved is down here and detached is up here. There's been a full rotation. In, in order to do this, if you were to do the geometry in your head, it's a, the, you get this if you do a rotation this way around the axis and then a rotation this way around the axis. If I were a mathematician, I would know all of these terms off the bat, but I can only explain what I'm seeing in my head. So if there's mathematicians watching this or people who are better at math than me, please let me know. I'll be very embarrassed if you're like, oh, Michael, you completely missed this important mathematical thing, and if you can explain it to me, I will be very happy with you, because this has been bugging me. Um, so that's why I'm making this video, because I couldn't figure it out myself. So, okay, so we've got that, and the, as I keep calling it, the nega, oh sorry, that is the nega structure, and the way that it goes is uh, sensation, our nega sensation, was the opposite, so it had to be detached, judging, and connotative, which would be right here. And then, spoiler alert, intuition is going to end up being over there, and I believe, yes, we end up getting negative thinking down here and negative feeling up here. Ha, huh, okay. And in fact, I'm beginning to realize in my head that, okay, at this portion of the video, we are going to go on this journey together because I just realized that the geometry that I was doing on my notes over there doesn't quite work here. So pardon me a moment as I try to figure this out. Um, because what we want to do is over here we have V, but then the nega structure you, obviously what you're tempted to do, this is judgment, so that, that would still work out, but the problem is then you have denotation over there, and in order to get not S, oh sorry, that's, yeah, because that's detached. So in order to get and detached is over here. See what I want, I'll, I'll just do what I wanted to do. Um, because it, if I believe the way that it works out is you end up getting a, um, a kind of Star of da David figure where you have two triangular prisms um, interpenetrating each other. That's not how that would be. It would be more like, uh... anyway, it, it's, it ends up being like a Star of David. Here, I'll just draw a star, David. 
But imagine that it's 3D. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a 3D structure um, of two triangular prisms interpenetrating each other, I believe, um, orthogonally. And what you end up getting, because I have drawn that before when I was trying to figure all this out, you end up getting an eight-point star. And it fills all this out nicely, but then we're back to the same problem over here that all of a sudden, because remember, the problem here is when we tried to represent the graph in geometric form, we suddenly realized there was an empty spot here where we could put the involved detached in. And the same thing occurs with the Star of David, except there's even more spaces that we can fill in. And then once we do that, we move back over to the table, the logic table, and we just can keep going back and forth for infinity and just keep multiplying the dichotomies that are there. Um, I'd be very interested to know if I've missed something here because this is very kind of just strictly logical, um, basically mathematical thinking, and I did make a little bit of a leap there because I didn't actually draw this. If I'd actually draw, drew that and shown here are the connections between them, but I didn't do that up there because there's a, it's difficult to do and there's a nagging thought, but... Yeah, I'll, I might do that in my own time and maybe make a note. But that, that's, I do know that it is an eight-pointed star and there would have to be more connections between it. So, so it would seem that if you want to have a parsimonious system, as I refer to it, you're going to end up multiplying off into infinity. Um, so you have to, right at the beginning, except that there is this element of overdetermination, which is very interesting to me because it implies that it's almost like quantum mechanics in a weird way, where you're switching, you keep the perceiving judging axis, but if you have that determined, then you can only really see either the, um, uh, uh, the denotative connotative axis, or you can flip back over to the involved detached axis, but you, if you do them at the same time, then it starts to multiply into infinity in this way. I don't know if that makes sense or if that, if that sounds quite right to y'all, but that, that's what's been going on in my head. So yeah, um, accept, accept, embrace the overdetermination um, of, of the structure. This is a very interesting idea, so. Uh, I'm going to make a part two to this, but I'll go ahead and end this video here because this is sort of the first leg. But if you accept the overdetermination, then there's some interesting stuff that happens once we go over to the temperament. So that will be part two. Cool.